Good morning. It's great to see everybody here this morning. Thank you so much for being here, whether you're in person or online today. We're so glad to have you with us uh, in worship. I want to share with you some things going on in the life of the church while I do that. If you would, give us a registration of your attendance today by filling out the red pew pads that are on the end of each row. Once you've done that, tear off the sheet and place it in the offering plate when it comes by a little bit later on in the service today. I am not going to go through all of the announcements because we've got several, but I do want to highlight just a few of them there and and invite you to take the bulletin home with you and and review it later when uh, you're trying to figure out where you need to be, where and when, and all that kind of good stuff. So today at uh, 1215, we've got our Board of Stewards meeting uh, that is uh, taking place in Harper Hall, so uh, please be aware of that. Bell Choir starts back at 3.30 today. Uh, And then at 4 o'clock, we've got Club 118. Club 118 is for our 4th, 5th, and 6th graders. And that is going to be at the Morris's home. I know there is a lot of playfulness going back and forth about which Morris's home, but uh, it's in Justin and Jade's home, okay? So please be uh, aware of that. Uh, also, we've got uh, Methodist men coming up on Tuesday. Uh, they meet at Milano's, and all the men of the church are invited to come be a part of that. Uh, that is uh, uh, 6 o'clock on Tuesday. And then Methodist women are coming up uh, on March the 6th uh, at 10 a.m. in the parlor, and all the ladies of the church are invited to be a part of that. Uh, We've got our potluck with a purpose coming up on Wednesday, March 13th in the Family Life Center, so mark your calendars for that. And then we're also going to be uh, having Easter lilies uh, this next month, part of Easter, uh, and that uh, we have a deadline uh, for that of March 24th, so uh, the lily sheets are in the, the foyer there if you want to, uh, in Harper Hall, if you want to fill those out, and you can purchase one in honor or in memory of someone. Uh, we sure would appreciate that. Uh, one other announcement that, that I have, you probably saw a notice go out today if you're on our email prayer list. Uh, Linda Pierce uh, is not long with us here. Uh, she's been at home and she's been on hospice and uh, went by to see her last night. Uh, she's not very responsive, uh, but she was able to acknowledge during prayer and, and, uh, and a few words of response and whatnot. But, uh, so we want to keep uh, Miss Linda in, in our prayers uh, as she will be joining uh, the church triumphant uh, sometime in the very near future. So please keep her in your prayers. All right, uh, any other announcements that we need to make? If not, then let's stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord. And it's all thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to that precious Please remain standing for our call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him. Sing praises to Him. Tell of all His wondrous works. Glory in His holy name. Let all the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. 
He is our Lord, our God. His judgments are all in the earth. Word of His commandment, all the generations. Praise the Lord. You may be seated as we prepare our hearts for worship. Stand with me, please, as we sing Love Divine, All Loves Excel. So today is the second Sunday of Lent. Do y'all know what Lent is? Yeah, what's Lent? What is that? Where you give up something. Good answer. So Lent is about 40-ish days that leads up to a really special day called Easter. That's right. So during Lent, a lot, a lot of us do give up something, like maybe we give up candy or chocolate or um, shopping or, or Facebook, which y'all don't have Facebook, which is, that's good, you don't need Facebook. Um, we give up something, and then every time we miss that thing, we kind of feel that, that sacrifice. We feel like, oh man, I missed that. That's, this is hard. Um, and that just gives us a little bit of a feeling of what Jesus felt like when he sacrificed for us, right? So it, it's really good, a good time in our Christian faith Um, to grow closer to God. So also during the season of Lent, we do something called confessing, which we do this all year long, but a lot of times we do it a little bit more during Lent. So do you know what confessing is? Yeah, okay. 
confessing her sins. Good job. All right. So um, when I was little, my, I, had a little, I have a little sister. Her name's Elizabeth. And we were in the kitchen fighting over a yardstick. Do you know what a yardstick is? It's, uh, okay. So it's like this wooden stick. And it's kind of, this one was a long one. It's like a four foot long wooden stick. And I don't remember why we were fighting over it, but we were. And um, in our kitchen, we have this glass panel door that it's also a screen door going out to the garage. So we were fighting over it back and forth and one of us let go and the other one pulled really hard. And where do you think the yardstick went? Into the glass door. That's right. Glass shattered everywhere. And we were like, what goes? So we cleaned it up. We threw away the glass, even though we were probably shouldn't have done that because it was really sharp, but we did. And do you think we told our parents? Uh, well, so at first we didn't, okay, um, but when our parents, do you think they noticed? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they did. They did. They noticed, and they were like, "Huh, what? What happened here? Who? Who did this?" And so we, we confessed. It was us. We did it. We're sorry. Um, so they did forgive us, but we we had to pay for it. We had to pay for the to replace the glass, which we did. Um, but I, w I wanted to tell you that story to kind of get an idea of what confession is. Confession is saying, I did this thing. I, I broke this window. I told a lie. I was jealous. I was selfish. I hit my sister. I punched my brother. I did something wrong. So when we confess, Sometimes we do that to our parents, sometimes we do it to our teacher, but we also do it to God, right? So when we confess to God, I did this thing, I messed up. Can you please forgive me? What do you think God says? Yes. Yes, he says, I forgive you, I love you. Did he already know we did it? Yes. Yeah. Did my parents already know me and Elizabeth broke the glass door? Probably, yes, yes, but, but it's good for us. It's good for our heart and our soul to tell the truth and to, and to repent and to confess our sins. And thankfully, we have a God who loves us and forgives us. Isn't that good news? All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to give you, uh, it's like a little calendar for Lent. So today is right here. It says the second Sunday of Lent. And then every day that you move down this little calendar, you can check off the box. And so like this one says, clean your room. That's a way of doing something good on Lent. This one says, no whining day. Oh my gosh. Um, this one says, give up unhealthy snacks. So maybe, so if you wanna do something for the whole Lent, that's great. If you wanna do one different thing every day, you can do this, um, or you can do this and something else. So anyways, every time, every day you do something, you just do a little check mark if there's a blank spot, I want you to think of something that you can do for God or something you can give up for, for Lent. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right, so I'm going to give you one of these, and then um, we're going to pray, and then we're going to go sit with our families. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us when we mess up. Help us to remember to confess to you when we sin, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Let us stand and join together in affirming our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to Bow your heads with me as we pray. Gracious Lord, as we continue in this season of Lent, as we continue through this journey to redemption, we ask that you would slow us down for just a little while. Our lives race hither and yon to this place and that place, from this distraction to that distraction. And at times, O oh Lord, it is going so fast that we fail to see even those things that trip us up, hold us back, and keep us from being persons you created us to be. At times, O oh Lord, we make excuses for ourselves. We rationalize and justify our behaviors that do not reflect your will. At times, O oh Lord, we carry our own burdens in secret. rather than coming and placing them at the foot of the cross. Lent is a season of reflection. Reflecting on those sorts of things that we need to be honest about. Those sort of things that we need to acknowledge in our lives those sort of things that we need to confess and to repent of. Help us, O oh Lord, to slow down, to pause, to reflect, to be honest. confess. Thank you for loving us enough to help us in this process. Because it is your desire for your children to run the race unencumbered with an eye on the prize of Jesus. And when we do slow down and when we do press pause when we do acknowledge our need of you and we confess our sins and agree with you that what we have done is wrong, and we come and lay those things at the foot of your cross, then, O oh Lord, and then can we know the joy of freedom and forgiveness, of healing and wholeness, Help us, O oh Lord, not to buy into the lie of the devil that would cause us to turn away from you. But rather, O oh Lord, may we come freely to the foot of the cross and there find healing and wholeness and forgiveness. And now, O oh Lord, we do just that as we come together and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we sing our next hymn in the spirit of confession, uh, I have to admit we did not check the slides on that last hymn before we sang, which was clear. Also, these, these, uh, these screens have a, a huge power over us, and uh, we're going to sing whatever's up there, which is, which is a good thing. But I do want to thank Landon for all of his hard work. But will you, for me, find a hymnal nearby, and will you grab a hymnal for me? Yeah, so will you open your hymnals to number 400? That's what we're going to read today. If you don't have enough, share with your neighbor. And if you have somebody who maybe doesn't know how to read a hymnal, maybe a son or a daughter, that's rampant in today's world. I will say that. There are a lot of my students who do not know how to read a hymnal. Yeah? So in the spirit of mentorship, will you help them to read this next song? Um, we're going to keep the slides going, right, for the live stream. I can't tell them to not. I might want to, right? But will you do your best? Will you sing this from the hymnal uh, for this next one just for me? This just your favorite to me. Will you stand as we sing number 400? Heavenly Father, we are thankful to be able to gather in your house on this beautiful Sunday morning. We are thankful, Lord, for the gift of your Son and our Savior, who came to earth to take our sins upon his shoulders. Lord, we are thankful for the answered prayers we lift up. We are thankful for all of the many blessings and talents and gifts you've given us. As we return some of our financial gifts to you, we pray that you would bless them to service throughout your world according to your will. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all the creatures here below. Praise Him, all the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Let us stand for our scripture reading. Our scripture today is the 32nd Psalm. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept my silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those whose trust is in the Lord. 
Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Jason read uh, today from the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version. Uh, it's, uh, that's the version I first used when I went into uh, to ministry. In fact, this is my Bible that I used for quite a number of years uh, early on in ministry. I remember at the seminary, they had a, a sale on these. They sold them for $10 a piece, uh, and it's been a great uh, Bible. But uh, I've long ago uh, switched from the NRSV to uh, the NIV. Uh, and have used the NIV for quite a number of years. That's been what we've read from for a number of years. But only this year we've uh, switched us over to the uh, New Living Translation is what we've been reading for you uh, this, uh, this particular year. Just having different translations gives you... Uh, uh, it, this, the meaning is the same, uh, but just kind of the nuance of it. The, the modern-day language or wording is a little bit differently, uh, but it still says the, uh, the same thing. So I do try to... To, to get you to, to hear the same message in different ways, because the one thing I don't want to see happen is for the Word of God to become rote uh, for us. Uh, in other words, it's, it's, it's like uh, the, the, the prayers of the Scriptures and things like that. We, we don't want uh, the Lord's Prayer to be something you mumble, or, or the Apostles' Creed something that you, you mumble. You know, it's like the old story about the, the church, the pastor went to this church, and, and uh, it was his first Sunday there, and it came time for the church to do the Apostles' Creed. And, and he said, well, let's stand as we recite together the great historic Apostles' Creed. And everybody stood up, turned around, faced the back wall. And the preachers kind of stood back, and they all recited the, Lord, or the, the Apostles' Creed right there. And then as soon as they were done, everybody turned back down, sat down. The preacher thought, well, pfft, somebody's pulling a joke on the new preacher, you know. So they all got together and, and did this. So he thought, well, let's see what happens next Sunday. Sure enough, next Sunday comes around. They turn around and face the back wall again on the Apostles' Creed and turn back around and sit back down. Finally, he gets up the courage and asks somebody, why in the world do you do that? Well, it turned out that back before this church had, a, had a, 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 enough money to buy hymnals or, or enough money to have screens or enough money to do any of that, they used to have the Apostles' Creed painted on the wall behind them. And it had been gone for years, but because it becomes such a rote thing for them, a, a habitual thing for them, they still stood up and turned around. Well, I, you know, that, that's part of the reason why I, I, I switch this around every so often, because I don't want you, uh, I don't want the Word of God to go in one ear and out the other, okay? Uh, and, and so uh, that's a long introduction, but anyway, thank you, Jason. Uh, I, this morning, though, I, I did want us to read from the, the new Revised Standard Version, uh, especially this Psalm uh, because of some of its word choices, I think it explains things a little bit uh, uh, broader for us. And we'll get into that here in, in just a little bit. But that wasn't the original joke I had lined up for you guys. So here you go. You get the joke twice. You get two jokes this morning, really, uh, if you want to call that first one a joke. But uh, here it is, all right? After the baptism of his baby brother in church, little Jimmy uh, cried and cried and cried all the way home. And Mama and Daddy couldn't figure out what in the world little Jimmy was crying about. They tried to ask him, you know, Jimmy, what's wrong? No, no, no. And just, just, finally, they got to the driveway, and they pulled into the driveway, and he calmed down just enough for them to get him to tell him what in the world was wrong. I mean, they'd had this beautiful day. His baby brother had been baptized and all this kind of stuff. And they said, please, tell us what's wrong. And, and little Jimmy, between sobs and tears, said, well, the, the, the preacher said he wanted us brought up in a Christian home and and they're like well what's so wrong with that he goes i wanted to stay with you guys <laughs> thanks a lot thanks a lot thanks a lot oh all right all right well uh let me ask you this have you ever been around a a, a truly happy person a truly happy person I'm not talking about somebody who wears a smile like as fake as a $2 bill or, or a $3 bill, pardon me, or, or somebody who's, who's, who's wired up on sugar and they're just bouncing off the walls. Happy. I'm, I'm talking about, have you ever been around somebody truly is a happy, happy person? Well, that's where we're going to begin after prayer here in just a minute. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, uh, give us ears to hear uh, the message you have for us today, a heart to receive it, and a life to be transformed by it. This we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? 
Amen. When Ken, King David looked around uh, at the, the happy people that he knew in his life, and when he looked at his own life and saw when he was happy, what he realized was there, that there was this connection between happiness and forgiveness. See what he writes in Psalm 32, the first two verses. He says, Happy are those whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, we're going to talk about that relationship here in just a minute between happiness and forgiveness. But before we do, I want us to, to look at these verses just quickly uh, and because it, they describe sin in four different ways. Now, we've talked about sin two Sundays in a row. We have not become Baptist, uh, uh, and I, this is not a hellfire and damnation sermon, but I, we are going to be honest about it, okay? We're going to talk about sin. And I, want to, I want to address the four different ways that, uh, that King David uh, addresses sin in this particular passage. The first word he uses is transgression. Now, that's a big $2 word, if you will. That's a, a, a fancy word. A transgression, in essence, in its Hebrew original language, means a premeditated disobedience of the will of God. This is, in other words, this is a sin with a plan. Uh, somebody has thought about it before he did something about it. He, he thought about it or she thought about it before she committed the sin. It's someone who knows in advance what they're going to do, knows that they shouldn't do it, uh, yet they make plans and they carry it out anyway. It would be as if somebody who knew they uh, wanted to get their way, but the only way they were going to get their way was to have to lie about it. And so they, in advance, thought about what they might say uh, to manipulate the situation or the person to get their way and whatever it is. And so they, they come up with a lie and they tell. That's a transgression, something that's premeditated, uh, premeditated disobedience of God's will. Now, the second word that David uses is a general term word. It's, the word is sin. Uh, sin is uh, easy enough. It's, uh, you know, when you study this passage and you look at it, what you understand that, that uh, this is kind of the generic word for, uh, for sin. It's, it, it's sin. Uh, it's not necessarily premeditated. It's not even necessarily a willful disobedience, but it is sin nonetheless. Now, in the New Testament, uh, when it uses this word for sin, it, it's using an archery term in the original language. Uh, sin, in the Greek, means to miss the mark. So if I'm an archer, I'm aiming for a bullseye, I want it to be perfect, and so you want it to be the absolute center of the, of the red dot of the bullseye. Uh, anything less than that is sin. Uh, anything less. So in, in spiritual terms, anything less than God's best for us, uh, as He has, has it laid out for us in Scripture about how we're supposed to live and who we're supposed to be and what we're to do and not to do, anything less than that uh, is sin. Uh, it's, missing, it's missing the mark. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, Verse 23, it says it this way. For all have sinned, and missed the mark in other words, and what? Fallen short of the glory of God. Anything short of the glory of God is sin. Now the third word which David uses is iniquity. I was always scared of that word iniquity and I, when I would hear the preacher read a passage when it talked about iniquity. Uh, it always sounded pretty scary to me because, quite frankly, it is. Iniquity is the sum total of all of our past misdeeds, of all of our past sins. Everything that, that we've done wrong, uh, if you were to somehow uh, uh, write them all down, calculate them all up, they would add up to, to uh, one's iniquity. Uh, uh, so uh, these are all the ways in our past that we have, we have walked uh, uh, in a path differently than, than God's. The fourth word he uses is more of a specific kind of word, and that word is deceit. Deceit implies a, a willful deception. Uh, it may not be premeditated, but it is certainly intentional. And the opportunity may have snuck up on us, but we willfully chose to do something with that opportunity, uh, something we know that, that God would not have wanted us to do. Now, when King David looks around at the people in his life who are happy, and when he looks at his own life, at times when he's happy, uh, he realizes that this happiness is deeply connected 
to one's experience of forgiveness in their lives. And it's his reference to all of these different words for sin that he, he uses to drive this point home. He is saying to us, if we want to know joy in this life, if we want to, to know a joy and a happiness in this life that, that is a contentment in and of itself, then we've got to experience uh, uh, forgiveness for ourselves. Not just a, a, a little bit of forgiveness, not just a, 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 an acknowledgement of forgiveness or, 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 or something you know, half-baked. No, no, he says we've got to genuinely experience the forgiveness of God in our lives. Not something we give lip service to. And not just something of the big sins in our lives, you know. He's saying, no, you need to know the forgiveness of all of the sins in your life. Not just the run-of-the-mill everyday sins either. All of the sins in your life. Premeditated sins, uh, willful sins, uh, sins of commission, sins of omission, as we talked about last week. He's talking about the whole kit and caboodle when it comes to sin in our lives. He wants us to know all of our sins are forgiven. And he says when we discover that, when we experience that for ourselves, it makes a difference in our lives. It makes a difference in how we live. It, it makes a difference in our contentment. It makes a difference in our joy. It makes a difference in, in whether we're happy or not now in the next part of the passage in the next part of the psalm david kind of shifts a corn turns a corner if you will and, and and he looks at the situation from from sort of a contrasting kind of a way uh he, he says in verses three and four uh while i kept silent my body wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of the summer. See, David was focusing on what made people happy in the first part of the passage. Now he's focusing on what makes people unhappy in the second part of that passage. And what he, he speaks of it as is those who experience unforgiveness in their lives or who are unwilling to seek the forgiveness God offers them, these are the persons uh, that are miserable. These are the persons in life that, that feel like, like, like it's just an overwhelming experience of, of, of being unhappy. Uh, he, he, he's very uh, uh, descriptive in his use of the language. He says, you know what, here's four things that he experienced. He said, when I failed to, to seek forgiveness, my body felt as if it, it was wasting away. It's as if uh, I, I was groaning in my spirit. I was groaning in my spirit all day long. It, was, it felt as if God's hand was heavy upon me and, and my strength, I just didn't have it in me anymore. My strength was all dried up. Have you ever felt that way before? Ha, have you ever felt the, the weight of, of your sin? Well, we're going to illustrate that right now, okay? And I've asked Miss Annalise to come up here. And she, let's give her a hand for coming up here, all right? Come stand right here, Miss Annalise, okay? Miss Annalise gets to wear the backpack today, okay? So you go ahead and put your arm through that and the arm through that, and she's going to be, help us do our illustration. I'm going to have you turn like this, okay? Now, in our lives, there are things that, uh, that we carry around with us, okay? And uh, it, it, it's our sin. If we don't turn to God in forgiveness, then the weight of our sin begins to weigh us down, you know? Things like, uh, you know, if we're dishonest and, and we don't confess that to God, Whoop, there you go. That hurt you. That didn't hurt you, did it? Okay, all right. So, so that kind of weighs down a little bit. Now, now hold on. Let's, 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 let's talk, think about this for a second. Now, if, if you and I were to have a race around the sanctuary right now, you'd probably be faster than me, wouldn't you? I'm kind of old and, you know, kind of big in the belly. You know, I'm out of shape. You'd probably beat me. But, but uh, uh, I'll ask you about that again in just a second, okay? So anyway, you know, there's all kinds of things that we, that we carry with us, you know, and weigh us back down and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, we've cheated in some way. We've cheated in something. You know, that's a weight. We carry that. If we don't confess that, that holds us down. That weighs us back. You know, then there's, uh, there's things like envy and jealousy, you know. We, we, we think that that's just us, you know. Yeah, but it's something that is, that is 
coming out of us. It's affecting our relationships, and it weighs down not only us, but also our, our relationships. And, and uh, you know, that can get kind of heavy on our lives, you know. And um, then there's things like hate and resentment, and uh, there's bitterness. And you doing okay there, sweetheart? You okay? That's not too much, is it? It feels like your school backpack. You've been prepared for this. Okay. All right. And then, you know, there's things like arrogance and pride. You know, those things weigh us down, you know? And, uh, all right, hold on. Okay. Hold on a second. Let me get you zipped up here. Oh, wait a second. I forgot, you know? Then there's those kinds of sins we don't talk about very much, you know? Those sins that, uh, that can weigh real heavy on us and, and that are real kind of secret sins you know that uh you don't discuss in good company things that maybe you thought or looked at or or relationships that you had that you shouldn't have had you know we got to deal with those too so i'm going to put this on you right here okay sweetheart and uh you just just stay right there don't go anywhere okay uh now i, I want to ask you now uh, annalise if uh if you and i were to have a race right now who'd win that's right, I'd win right now, wouldn't I? Is that pretty heavy on you? Yeah. All right, you want to go sit down right now? No, 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 don't move, don't move, don't move, don't move. I'm not going to, but you can feel the weight of that, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a fun way to live life, would it be? Mm -hmm. Not at all, not at all. Let's give Annalise a hand here. I'll get that off you. Hold on a second here. In Hebrews, the Bible says, let us run the race that's set out before us with our eyes fixed on Jesus. And the way it tells us that we're to do that, thank you, sweetheart, is to throw off all that which hinders us. To throw off the sin that, that so easily entangles us, that, that weighs us down and keeps us from being the people that God has called us to be and from doing the things that God has called us to do. You see, what David realizes is that holding on to our sins, unconfessed sins, becomes a weight that affects the entire person. It affects our spirit. It affects our health. It affects our mental status. It affects us emotionally. It affects us relationally. Sin, unconfessed, works against us like a cancer that eats away at our soul. Unconfessed sin weighs down our body. Many times it comes to us in the, the form of guilt. We feel guilty about things we've said. We feel guilty about things we've done. We feel guilty about things that we should have been doing and haven't been doing. But here's the thing I want you to know about guilt. Not all guilt is bad. In fact, the Bible tells us that the, that the, the Holy Spirit... Uh, is involved in our feeling guilty sometimes. He tells us that uh, Jesus is talking to His disciples and, and talking about how God is going to send them the Holy Spirit. And, and He says to them, listen, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will come to convict the world of guilt in regards to their sin." I believe this is what David was talking about in the psalm when he says, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. God was placing this feeling, this sense of conviction, or, or, or sometimes described as guilt, upon David. Now, why in the world was he doing this? Was he doing this because he wanted David to feel terrible? Was he doing this because he, he was just a mean and vindictive God and he, 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 he wanted to, to, for David to, to carry this weight and he's laughing at him? No, no, that's not the way... God works at all. There's, you see, there's a big difference between guilt or conviction of sin and shame. There's a big difference between uh, guilt and shame. Guilt we feel about the things that we've done. Shame is about who we are and how we feel about who we are. Listen to this. God is in the business of convicting us of the guilt of our sins. It's the devil who is in the business of trying to make us feel ashamed of who we are you see god god doesn't want to push us into a place of shame uh, but he does want us to push us into a place of renewal in life and sometimes he needs to to help us along the way you see in ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 it says we are god's workmanship created in christ jesus to do good works god god's not about tearing us down 
when we feel the weight of God's hand upon us like He did upon David, it's not an issue of Him wanting us to feel in a bad place or to feel terrible about ourselves. No, that is not who God has, has created us to be. God's business is about building us up into Christ's likeness. And yes, God is a God of justice and God is a God of love and mercy and grace. And, and, and sometimes God places conviction upon our hearts but it's not so that we will run away from Him. That's what shame does. Shame is the sort of thing we feel terrible about who we are. That's the lie of the devil. It becomes from I've done a bad thing to I am a bad person. That's where the devil wants us to be. When we realize, hey, I've done a bad thing, that conviction that we feel, that is intended not to drive us away from God, but rather to drive us to God. Guilt says, I've done something bad and I need God to forgive me. I better run to the Lord. Shame says, I'm a bad person and I can't go anywhere near God. And that causes us to run away from God. That is the devil's playground in our lives. You see, the heavy hand of God serves to be a warning light. Kind of like on the dashboard of your car when, when something goes wrong with your car, the engine's not working right or it's time for an oil change in some cars or things like that. There'll be this little light that comes on on your dash, a red light, orange light, yellow. I don't know what yours is, but everybody's is different. But it's a warning light nonetheless. Uh, how many of y'all let those things kind of go? Anybody want to confess today? All right, it's happened before. All right. I had a friend uh, who, who let one of those go in college and and, uh, and they thought that, oh, it'll be okay, no big problem. Well, it turned out to be her change oil light. Guess what happened to that car engine? Guess how Daddy was feeling when, when uh, he had to come up there to, fit, to try to figure out what was next for this girl. Yeah, The warning light is a, is a, is a light of conviction or the, or the guilt of sin. It goes off in our hearts. And, and what that tells us then is, is a warning. It tells us, hey, I need to get my car in the garage. I need to take my car back to the divine and holy mechanic of God so that he can get under the hood, so that he can fix what's wrong and take care of things so that I can get back out on the road of life. But too many times, too many times, we're busy uh, doing exactly the opposite. You know, David acknowledged that as a, as a warning light. He acknowledged that, that weight of God that he was feeling as a, as a warning light. He said it in Psalm 32, verse 5. Then I acknowledge my sin to you. In other words, I acknowledge that this light was going off. And I did not hide my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. So many times people go through life and, and, the, and they have that warning light going off and they, they try to, to rationalize it and they try to uh, uh, justify it or they try to ignore it. Anybody want to be honest and tell me that you didn't put duct tape over the warning light in your car? I've known somebody that did that. They didn't want to look at it anymore. They weren't dealing with it. They weren't taking it to the divine mechanic that needed it. What does David do? He sees it as the warning light that it is, and he turns to the Lord, and what does he say happens? He says, God, in that moment, forgave me of my sin. The good news of the Gospel of Jesus Christ is that when we are faithful to confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us. As it says in 1 John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, He who is faithful and just will forgive our sins. Forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you know what the essence of confession is? Do you know what the essence of confession is? The essence of confession is agreement. When we get to that place where we confess our sins to God, in essence, what we are doing is we are agreeing with God. God, you're right. That was harmful. God, you're right. That was wrong of me. God, you're right. That was going to be something that was going to weigh me down and hold me back and harm my relationships with someone else and with you. That's what confession is. We're basically saying, all right, God, you know what? You're right. I don't need this in my life. I need you to to come and, and, and forgive me and heal me and fix me and 
and work in my life. The problem, though, is how many times have we put a sticker over it? How many times have we tried to justify our actions? How many times have we tried to rationalize things to, to ignore the low oil signal or whatever it may be? Oh, it's nothing. I can go a little bit longer. That sensor must be broke. Where's my duct tape? But you know what? It doesn't mean there's not a problem. It doesn't mean there's not a sin that is entangling us, that is keeping us back, that is holding us from running the race that God has us to run. And so God, out of love, out of love, will at times lay that hand upon us and say, I love you too much to let this slide into shame. I love you too much to let this keep you from being all that you're called to be. I love you too much uh, to let this rule your life and weigh you down and hold you back any longer. Please, please, come run to me. I think the weight that, that, uh, of the hand of God that David felt was less about pushing David down and more about pushing David in a gentle way to turn around and to turn back to God. You see, David saw the warning light on the dashboard of his life and he responded to it uh, because he had learned uh, the key to a happy life. Did, did you catch it earlier? He, he said it in verse 10. The key to the happy life. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Do you see the key? The key is trust. We have to trust that God has our best interest in mind. We have to trust that God is ready, willing, and able to forgive us of any and all of our sins. In his life, David had learned somewhere along the way to trust God. Maybe it was when he was standing out in that field across from, from Goliath with just a sling and some stones and the Israelite army quaking in the boots behind him. Maybe it was when Saul was out chasing him around and, and trying to kill him that he learned to, to trust God. Maybe when he, it was when he was ruling as king. Somewhere along the way, David learned to trust God even with his biggest sins. Y'all know the story of David, don't you? David was king. It says in the spring when all the, the uh, armies would go out to war, uh, David was uh, with them, right? Wrong. That's not where he was. Uh, in fact, David was back home. That's, he wasn't where he should have been. That's usually your first sign you're going to get in trouble if you're not in the place where you need to be or you should be. Well, he was out on his rooftop. And, and think about this. This is David's rooftop. This isn't just your average uh, 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 middle-of-the-road kind of fellow. No, this is the king. His rooftop was higher than everybody else's. And, and his rooftop was like everybody else's in the sense that that was a place of, uh, where people would live and go to and, and do things. And sometimes they, had, they you know, worked out on their, their, their rooftop and even sometimes they bathed out on their rooftops and sure enough his rooftop was so high he was able to spy across the way a beautiful lady named Bathsheba who caught his attention and he thought I need to get to know this girl well he, David uh, uh, did call for her he sent some fellas they came they got her she came to him they spent a little uh, time together if you will and uh, lo and behold Bathsheba ends up pregnant and David uh, uh, begins to think about things we call that premeditation. <laughs> he was premeditating a way to get out of this situation. And so he thinks, well, gosh, Uriah, her husband, is off at war. I'm going to have him come back on a, on a weekend pass. And maybe, you know, they can spend some quality time together. And, and, uh, uh, and, and everything will be taken care of. We can say it's his baby. And so he comes back from the war, and he's a man of honor. He's a man of honor. He doesn't take advantage of the privileges of being home because... Uh, his men out on the battlefield don't have the privileges of being home. And so he sleeps outside and, and David then goes even a step further and he gets him drunk and, and uh, uh, thinking, oh, that'll do it. He'll, <laughs> he'll find his way home. And, and, and Uriah still even drunk is a man of honor and, and does not go to be with his wife in that way. And, and, and sure enough, David then has to go even a step further than that. And, and he, he gets others involved in his sin and he tells some of his his commanders, listen, I want you to take your guys up to the front with Uriah. And, and as soon as Uriah is up front, uh, close enough to the battle, I want you to withdraw from him, but don't tell him. 
And sure enough, Uriah is killed in that moment. Uh, and David then takes Bathsheba as his own. And he thinks everything's good, uh, but it's not. He put the duct tape on the dashboard of his life. Uh, he, he tried to ignore it. He tried to rationalize it. He tried to justify it. I'm king. I'm sure he said all kinds of things. But it wasn't until uh, God uh, uh, told Nathan about things. Nathan the prophet came and sought David out. And, and there uh, he laid out this story for David about someone stealing a poor person's lamb or sheep that was like family to them just so he could feed somebody else and and the way he told the story david got really worked up he was very upset about this you know this person deserves to die this person that has stolen the the lamb of someone that was precious to them and and nathan looks at him says you are this man and david knows exactly what nathan's talking about no sin is hidden from god david knows this but instead of, uh, 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 of, of running off into that place of shame, instead of, of, of making excuses and using his power as king to, to have Nathan killed or, or, or to, to do anything like that, instead David is reminded somewhere in his heart of hearts of the fact that God is trustworthy. And so he humbly repents of his sin and confesses, owns it up to it. And he goes to the Lord, and what does he say in Psalm 32? He forgave me of my sin. See, the story of David contains all four of those different types of sin. It contains premeditated and preplanned transgression. It contained falling short and missing the mark in general terms. It contained past iniquities, and it contained spontaneous and willful deceit. All four sins were contained in that story. And yet, we see that in his humility, as he confessed his sin to God, he came to that place where he knew he could trust his Lord to receive him and to forgive him. That he knew God to be faithful. And David came to that place and there he found forgiveness. You see, conviction really is a gift. It's not a punishment. It's not intended to push us away. It's intended to draw us near. Conviction says, hold on a second, something's wrong here. I need to turn this car around. And I need to head into the shop. I need to turn my heart towards God. You see, God is, is remember, He's the prodigal father. The word prodigal means extravagant and lavish. And when we tell the prodigal son story, we talk about how he was extravagant and lavish in spending the inheritance that he got early from his father. And he ran off into the foreign land and, and he, he blew it all. But, but the word prodigal also speaks to the lavish love of the father who waited uh, not behind his desk for his son to come home and go, when that dirty, rotten scoundrel gets home, I'm going to give him a tongue lashing and, 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 and all that kind of good stuff. No, it describes the love and the grace and the mercy that was described by the father who stood on the front porch day in and day out looking down the road for his son's return. And when the son finally figured it out and, and, and was at his wit's end and he turned around and he came up the walkway of the path with his hat in his hand, his tail between his legs and the ratty clothes on his back. His dad didn't stand up on the porch and just ready to give him a, 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 a tongue lashing. Instead, what do we hear? We hear that the, the father lifted up his, his robe and he ran down the path and he threw his arms around his son and he said, this is my son. Go and let's have a party. Put a ring on his finger. Kill the fatted calf for the son who was lost has been found, who was dead is now alive. God's posture towards us is always one of open arms. And when we have the faith to trust that that is truth, then we will turn to Him when the warning lights go off. We will turn to Him when we begin to feel the conviction. You see, God is not up here wanting to beat us up. He's wanting to free us. 
from the sin that so easily entangles us. He wants to take the weight of the backpack off of us. He wants to take the the weight of the, the ball and chain of our sin off of us. And He wants it to drop to the ground so that we can then run free. Sorry if you're asleep there for a minute. (laughs) You're not now, I hope. I want us to take just a couple of minutes to pray. I don't know where you are. I don't know what God is doing in your life right now. I don't know what this is speaking to you. But if there is uh, uh, something that is lighting up on your dashboard right now, that is an indicator to uh, to, uh, uh, come to the Lord. So I'm going to invite Carrie to play a little bit for us. And I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me. You can sit where you are right now. You can come forward to this altar. Kneel. But I'm going to pray for us. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you today admitting that we are sinners. That we are in need of a Savior. Father, we come to you uh, admitting that there have been times in our lives when we have ignored your warning. We've tried to brush off your conviction. We've tried to cover up with duct tape the warning light on the dashboard of our lives. We've rationalized it. We've tried to justify it. Father, we humbly come before you now confess that we were wrong we agree Lord that our sin keeps us back weighs us down keeps us from running the race that you have set out for us so Father free us now as we come to you in this time of silence to confess our sin to you and I invite you now just in the quietness of your own heart at your pew or here at this altar rail come and to pray you know this is not out loud this is between you and the Lord take this time of silent confession with every eye opened, every head up, I want you to receive this. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen? Amen. Amen. May you walk from this place a little lighter, and may it make more room for the love of Christ to be shed abroad in your hearts as you have cleared out the clutter that has been holding you back. That is the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. This time I invite you to sing our closing song this morning. It is freely, freely. If you're here this morning, God is moving your heart and life to publicly profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or if you have already done that and you're ready now to talk about membership and what that means, I'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, give me a call this week and we can set up a time. I do know we have a couple who has did this this past week, and uh, they will be coming forward today uh, in membership, and we're very excited about that. Uh, if you need more prayer, your, the altar is, continues to be open, and you're welcome to come and uh, to kneel as you feel led. Let us stand together as we sing freely, freely.
welcome to, uh, to Professor Faith in Jesus Christ and to join us in, in membership. I had the privilege of, of doing their wedding how long ago? Two and a half years, Two and a half years ago. And, and uh, they've been uh, active over at the Mission House and, and in this service. And so uh, the questions that I have for you today are this. Uh, do you believe in God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord? Yes. Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the Holy Scriptures? Yes. Do you promise, according to the grace given to you, to keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in the same all the days of your life as faithful members of Christ's holy church? And with that, I ask you now the question of membership. Will you be loyal to Christ through Bullard Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness as Christ's representatives in the world? Yes. With that, I extend you the Christian fellowship and brotherly love, a welcoming handshake, and we are so glad that you have come to be a part of this congregation. Let's welcome them. I know these folks will want to, uh, to greet you on the way out today, so I'm going to go ahead and invite you if you want to go stand on that back wall right over there, uh, and they'll shake your hands as you, as you head on out. Sound good? Thank okay. You. All right. And for the rest of us, would you receive now this benediction? Go forth from this place of the children of God with a little lighter load. And may that lightness of step and foot leads you along the path of righteousness as you walk to share with the world of the joy that you have found in Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in Christ. Amen.